Unless you've been living under a rock for the last six months, then you've probably heard of Kiro, AWS new AI assisted development IDE. I've been using Kiro on and off since May, but because of the road to reinvent hackathon, I found myself using it almost exclusively for my development tasks for the last month. While it did take me some time to get used to it, I've come to really enjoy the workflow that it uses called spec driven development. Today in this video, we're going to go into what Kiro is, what spec driven development is, and why I believe it's superior to just standard AI assisted development. We're going to dive into an example project that I feel really showcases the power of a spec-driven development workflow. Hi, if you're new around here, my name is Ryan. I'm an AWS Certified Solutions Architect and Developer, and my goal is to teach you modern cloud system design using AWS. Let's jump in. So what exactly is Kiro? Kiro is an agentic IDE that works alongside you to turn your prompts into detailed specs and then into code, documentation, and tests. It's built on VS Code's open source foundation and delivers AI-assisted development capabilities while preserving the familiar interface of VS Code. Now, while Kiro can do vibe coding, it really excels at spec-driven development. So what is spec-driven development? Spec-driven development is a modern software approach that focuses on creating detailed structured specifications or specs before writing any code. These specs act as an executable blueprint for developers, or in this case, AI agents, to then build software from. With normal vibe coding, you give AI a prompt and you ask it to build something, and the quality of what it builds is directly related to the quality of the prompt that you give it. Now, spec-driven development doesn't necessarily replace vibe coding, but I think it makes vibe coding much more effective because the application is derived from a concrete specification that can be used as context. Now, while spec-driven development is not new, I think that Kiro represents an important and much needed evolution in the approach to AI-assisted development. To be clear, vibe coding is not bad, and it definitely has its function. It optimizes for speed and completion, while spec-driven development optimizes for correctness. Vibe coding starts to break down in situations where requirements and consistency matter, or when multiple people are touching code, or when systems begin to scale beyond a certain point. The problem is implicit intent. When intent is not explicit, AI will attempt to fill in the gaps. Sometimes this works, but oftentimes it doesn't. Kira was designed to put spec-driven development at the forefront of the AI-assisted development process. While I was not completely sold on it at first, I've begun to fall in love with Kiro and the spec-driven development workflow for the following reasons. One, it forces decisions early. As an example, let's take developing an API. It makes you ask things like, are unknown fields allowed? What kind of errors are returned? What should the input look like in exact terms? What is explicitly in or out of scope for this particular feature? Two, AI becomes an enforcement machine and it stops guessing. Instead of hoping that you get what you want out of a given prompt, you instead get an AI that follows a very specific contract which yields a massive gain in reliability. Three, code becomes boring, but in a good way. Boring code is stable code. Spec-driven development is predictable, explicit, easy to review, and hard to accidentally break. And it also massively improves debugging on the back end. Now, I'm not anti-vibe coding, and I still use it for things like exploring new ideas and possibilities or debugging very specific parts of an application. But spec-driven development has begun to fundamentally shift how I approach software and how I view my job as a developer in this rapidly evolving world of AI. So let's jump into using Kiro to build a request validation API. Before we jump into building, let's explore the Kiro IDE a little bit. You'll notice right off the bat that it looks very similar to VS Code. On the left-hand side, we're gonna to go to the Kiro tab, which is just this little ghost. You're gonna see four different sections here. First is going to be our specs, and we're gonna dive into this more here in a little bit. Next, we have our agent hooks. These are just repetitive tasks that you want Kiro to run based on automated triggers. For example, let's say anytime Kiro creates a TypeScript file, we wanna ensure that it type checks it and ensures that it passes the linter. Next, we have agent steering. And agent steering can be defined either at the workspace level or on a global level for all of your Kiro projects. Now, Kiro was designed to be unopinionated in the way it builds software. This is because developers themselves are inherently opinionated. And steering documents are how you enforce those opinions in the code that Kiro generates. I've included some general guidelines just for this workspace. This will enforce specific coding styles and certain preferences that I have when it comes to building things specifically with Lambda and the C++ 
CDK. For example, I want Kiro to make sure that it destructures its imports for all of the CDK stacks it creates. I also want to make sure that it uses the most up-to-date node runtimes for all of the lambdas it makes. And you can explore this a little bit more and of course change anything that you don't like in here to whatever fits your preferences. Finally, MCP servers. These are the MCP servers I recommend for this project and you can ensure that Kiro can communicate with them because there's a check mark next to each one. If we jump back into the file explorer, we can see that at the root of our repository, we have a .kiro folder. This is where all of your workspace specific MCP servers, hooks, steering documents, and specifications live. Now let's talk a little bit about what we're going to build. We're going to build a single API endpoint with a single method. It's going to be slash validate and it will only allow post. It's going to accept a JSON payload, enforce very strict validation rules, normalize all of the valid inputs it receives, and return deterministic error responses. We're keeping this intentionally small because the point is not features, the point is correctness. And we're going to be seeding Kiro with a prompt to kick off our spec-driven development workflow. And you're gonna be able to find it here in this Kiro spec seed markdown that I'll have in the repository linked down in the description. So over here on the right-hand side, we see this is how we communicate with Kiro. We've got two different options where we can opt to do traditional vibe coding or we can do spec-driven development. So we'll select spec-driven development and then we're just going to copy and paste our spec seed here and send it off to Kiro. Now, the first thing that you'll notice is that on any prompt that you send to Kiro, whether it's in vibe coding or in spec-driven development, Kiro will read from whatever steering documents you have either at the workspace level or at the global level. So whenever you send a prompt, you can see what context Kiro is using. Now, as soon as this process starts, we can go over here in our .kiro folder and we can see the spec subfolder with the request validation API. And we can see our requirements markdown document that was generated. The Kiro spec-driven development workflow has four main phases. Requirements, design, implementation plan, and execution. First, Kiro will generate a set of requirements for the app or the feature that we wanna build based on the initial prompt that we give it. It generates the requirements based on the easy approach to requirements syntax or EARS standard. This means that the document will include user stories, definitions, and clear acceptance criteria for the application or the feature to be considered complete. Now I'm gonna mention this here because it's the most important part of spec-driven development. At every single stage, ensure that you are verifying what Kiro is going to build. The quality of the final product that Kiro creates is directly related to the quality of spec that you define right now. Spec-driven development can lead to a large amount of what Werner Vogels calls verification debt. Taking the time to understand what Kiro intends to build before it starts building it is what sets spec-driven development apart from just regular vibe coding. It gives you and Kiro a concrete set of requirements that you can understand before any code is actually written. This helps put you and Kiro on the same page before the project even begins. The more time you take to really understand what Kiro intends to build and shape the spec accordingly now, the easier time you will have debugging things if there are issues later. So right now I'm going to read through the requirements document and ensure that Kiro is going to build what I want it to. All right, so I just finished reading through the requirements and everything looks good to me. This is honestly one of the most impressive things about Kiro is the level of detail that it goes into on these requirement documents. A lot of times it can discover edge cases or certain requirements that I totally forgot in the initial prompt. So because we validated these requirements and everything looks good to us, let's go ahead and move on to phase two, the design phase. In phase two, Kiro will document the technical architecture, the sequence diagrams, and the implementation considerations for the feature. The design document will capture the big picture of how the system will work as well as the different components and their interactions. So as Kiro's generating the technical design, you can see on the right-hand side that it's calling the various MCP servers that we defined at the beginning. This is great because it means that Kiro is searching for the most up-to-date and best practices for designing whatever feature we want to implement. All right, so design just finished. We can jump over here into the second markdown document that was created by Kiro. And one thing to note is that this is the document where you're going to want to call out specific technologies, architectures, and package versions that you want to use in your implementation. For example, I know that Kiro has a tendency to default to old versions of Node for Lambda runtimes. I'm going to go ahead and read through this and ensure that the technical implementation matches what I expect. 
All right, excellent. So the technical implementation that Kiro is going to use for this feature looks great. Now we're gonna go ahead and move on to phase three and build our implementation plan. In phase three, Kiro will break the work down into discrete trackable tasks with clear descriptions and outcomes. Each task is clearly defined with a clear description, expected outcome, and any necessary resources or dependencies. And if we jump over here into our task list, we can see that the task document provides an executable interface that updates in real time as Kiro completes completes them. And you can see here on the right that Kiro gives you the option of marking certain tasks as optional. And this is based on whether or not you want just a quick MVP or if you want to bake in testing and validation from the very beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the task list and ensure that everything looks good. All right, so the task list looks good to me. I've opted to keep all of our testing and things as optional steps just because I want to get this MVP up and running as quickly as possible. So like I said, the tasks document is an executable interface. We can just go ahead over here and click on start task. Now we've officially entered phase four, which is the execution phase. Kiro is going to track progress as tasks are completed. And we also have the option to update and refine the spec as we go. And if we hop over here into the requirements, we can update anything in either requirements or design and then choose to refine the requirements document based on that and then jump over into our tasks list and update the tasks based on the changes that we made. Now, for the purposes of this demo, because I think that Kiro has done a pretty good job of outlining the requirements of what I wanna build, I'm not actually going to change anything and I'm just gonna go ahead and execute all of these tasks one by one. Kiro will also ask you before it runs any commands in your terminal. And you have the option to trust commands based on certain patterns if you wish. So once it's done with all these tasks, we're gonna come back and we're gonna see what it's built. All right, so Kiro has finally finished executing all 12 tasks in our tasks markdown. Now we're gonna go ahead and deploy what it's built and then we're gonna test it out of the box to ensure that everything works the way that we want it to. Deployment was successful and now Kiro has given us a CLI command so that we can go ahead and curl the endpoint and ensure that it works. So let's run it and see what happens. It looks like we got a successful response back because that was a valid JSON object. Now let's go ahead and try it with an invalid one. So that response is working because it tested a malformed email as well as an age that was not high enough. And we can see that our response got back two separate errors telling us exactly what was wrong about the input. Let's go ahead and test some of our other validation cases. So it looks like a bunch of other cases are also working. We tested with the wrong HTTP method as well as a malformed JSON body and an incorrect content type header. Now, obviously before shipping something like this, I would go through the code file by file and understand exactly what Kiro wrote and what its implementation was. But I think this is a pretty great example of how powerful spec-driven development can be when you take the time to write detailed specifications. Kiro is far from perfect, and it does have a number of small and frustrating bugs that I've found. For example, while I was recording this, Kiro got hung up executing one of its tasks, and I had to kill the window and restart it. And I will say that spec-driven development is front-loaded with work. It takes time to think through a new application or feature and accurately describe what you're trying to build in English. And even with great requirements, you are not 100% guaranteed to get everything that you want every single time. I found that it's generally better to try to keep the scope of what you're trying to build small and focused. But I would say that one of the biggest benefits of spec-driven development is the fact that the specs are in a human-readable format. This means that they can be collaborated on by different technical and non-technical stakeholders before any code is actually written. It also makes the output much more deterministic and less chaotic than just traditional vibe coding. So I would argue that the final product is almost always worth the upfront time investment. So now I turn it over to you. Have you used Kiro yet? What's your experience been like? I'm really curious to know your feedback on this, so let me know down in the comments. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.